This video is brought to you by Raycon. Click the link in the description for 15% off your first purchase. I admit I was a bit ambivalent for Has Been Hotel, but I think it's similar for everyone who has gotten a bit bogged down over the negativity and baggage surrounding season two of Hell of a Boss, despite its mid-season resurgence. And when Has Been did premiere, it did have somewhat mixed reception. However, what did become very refreshing was how complete newbies to the series, those who have not been bogged down by Spindleverse baggage, were just having fun with it. It may not be the best thing ever, but there was obvious talent and energy and jubilance, and its songs were absolute bangers mostly. Notably, I have not been on the Dumb Bird app for a while, but if the view counts on Has Been videos are any indication, you're outnumbered. And honestly, if anything about this series was going to be a success, I would have wanted it to be the music, if only just because of this stupid, stupid, stupid trend recently where Hollywood is afraid to admit that musicals are musicals. Yeah, because it's not like musicals have been some of the biggest box office makers of all time, or that the songs themselves in an age of viral marketing are constantly one of the best ways to advertise a movie, almost more than the trailer. And yes, it is organically cathartic to see the rated R Disney parody Princess of Hell musically run circles around Disney's latest disappointment. People wanted a return of the villain song, Hell is Forever is the best villain song that has been made since the 90s renaissance fight me. Not even that, just comparing the opening numbers is like comparing Pinocchio to Pinocchio. Oh wait, I'm sorry, Polly Shore's Pinocchio was occasionally funny and ergo had substance and memorability. I'm sorry, it's just, Almost fascinating how much Welcome to Rosa is a black hole of meaninglessness. It's honestly embarrassing. Then in addition, Poison, Stayed Gone, Loser, and Hell's Greatest Dad are some of the best songs we might get this year. And Respectless, more than anything, and Happy Day in Hell are like B pluses. And Poison even made it to 23 on the Billboard 200. Tell me, how many Wish songs made it there again? And while we're talking about awesome things to put in your ear holes, I need to thank this video's sponsor, Raycon. Ah, finally, one of the YouTube classics. And I am genuinely thrilled to be sponsored by Raycons because I have been using Raycons Everyday Earbuds for years and I adore them. Because I used to be a passionate earbuds hater. I couldn't stand them. They were uncomfortable, they would fall out. So I was grateful to discover that Raycon solved all of my worries. Everyday earbuds are so comfortable in my ears because of the perfect fit and the optimized gel tips. And they come with a range of different sizes to help them fit even better. It was also important to me to find a kind of earbud that could stand a decent amount of physical activity are still comfortable laying down and don't sting or itch if they're in there for an extended period of time. Like, oh, just randomly when you're delayed six hours at an airport. But I have never had to worry about that with Raycons. They have amazing sound quality. The buds have battery life for up to eight hours. They can be charged in the case, which itself can hold up to 32. The buds themselves also have touch functions that allow you to control the sound source from far away. And Valentine's Day is coming up, so if you want to give your loved one or just yourself something pretty and practical, click the link in the description or go to buyraycon.com slash 24 to get 15% off your Raycon purchases plus free shipping. So how is Hell of a Boss's predecessor and how much does the pacing really hurt it? I think not quite as much as some people are saying, and I think that that was also affected by what we thought Has Been Hotel was going to be, especially if you had seen the pilot. Kind of like how Charlie was clearly a homage to a Disney princess. Inside of every demon is a rainbow, inside every sinner is a shiny smile. Then the episodes might be parodies or adult riffs of children's television lesson of the week. Though, <laughs> isn't that basically just South Park? But imagine if they had had to write Princess Charlie letters. Oh my god, that would have been so funny. Dear Princess Charlie, today I learned that Husker sucks balls and I hope he drowns in a fire. That didn't quite end up happening, which is a shame because that format likely would have been even funnier given the actual unveiling that despite how much Charlie talks about the hotel, the plan for the hotel, advertising the hotel, pitching the hotel, showing off the hotel, rebuilding the hotel, she has no idea what she's doing. Supposedly starting this entire process with a superficial or completely accurate impression of heaven, the actual redemption process is simplistically lame team building exercises and role play with her personal scripts, which inadvertently reveals what she initially thinks are the sins to be corrected for heaven access. Basically drugs, premarital sex, and being mean. 
and then gets into a very panicked tizzy when this somehow doesn't end up working. And that makes perfect sense given that Charlie herself has virtually no inclinations or temptation to any of the sins or unsavory practices that her citizens do so in abundance which contributes to her feeling a kind of cultural connection to at least her impression of heaven than the place where she's actually been raised. So that's why her hotel pitch on the news basically came off as, hey, you know those guys that kill us every year? Well, let's go join them. Their culture is more civilized than ours anyway. So in practice, this became the equivalent of somebody who's never had a drink running an AA clinic, where their core piece of advice was basically just don't drink. It's that easy. In other words, Charlie is an amazing protagonist and I love her. Wow, best princess, best villain, best songs. Did Spindlehorse literally make a demon pact to absorb all of Disney's competency? And yet for all of her ambition, she has a strong aversion to being aggressive or unpleasant in any way and unwilling to unleash her full power in strength or authority. Command a little more authority. But that's so mean. In tandem with her desire for the redemption plan and her complicated feelings toward her father, I believe this is because she suffers from massive privilege guilt that she is in no danger during the extermination and shame from her angel lineage that commits the extermination. But if we all get redeemed, then my complicated feelings will magically go away. And then heaven's mask off moment and then it's like, fuck it, demon princess magical girl it is. And we do see some of Charlie's growth in relating to her citizens rather than just coddling, expressed in the way that more cursing has snuck its way into her speech. Ha! The swearing has a point, you f**ktards! It really doesn't matter, though I really love how apparently they retaliated to this exact criticism with literally a challenge for the cast to describe their characters with as many swear words as possible. Ah, you basic bitch critics. But that's exactly why I would have liked to have seen more of her learning why the citizens fall victim to temptations and vices in the first place. And that is really it. When you get down to the pacing issues, it is just that people are used to a season one being 10 to 12 episodes, if not more. And episode three is awfully quick to be dropping the mystery that was one of the big hooks of the premiere. And it does serve as a testament that we like these characters enough that we want to see more of them. But in terms of what the season needed, to each his own, but I certainly feel like we needed more time for our found family to feel more like a found family. So sure, more episodes, even a clean 10, would have been appreciated, but as far as I know, it also couldn't be helped. So what honestly irked me more was the pacing and the screen time priorities of the episodes that we already had. Screen time priorities and economic storytelling is a thing with me lately, and yes, that is another reason why Wish has soured on me by the hour which has always been a thing, but this was really kickstarted when I saw Fiona and Cake last year, especially the episode The Winter King. I was just absolutely floored at just how much they were able to pack into 20 minutes. So I get very frustrated when I see bloat or fat in the script that could easily be shaved, and I especially feel this when it comes to character introductions. Mimsy's lines could have been cut in half, love Rosie, but her time definitely could have been halved. And we got that Adam was an asshole within 10 seconds of meeting him. He definitely didn't need to go as long as it did. But my real big take is how much a lot of my narrative problems could be solved if we just rewrote most of episode three, which I think is the weakest episode by far. Not all of it. We can keep the meeting of the overlords and respectless and even the initial trust exercise. But the problem is, is that it's really one of the only two episodes where we're actually trying to do redeeming stuff only for the titular bonding to happen off screen for the rest of the has-beens because the rest of the screen time is being taken up by Carlotta and Vaggie's duet, which is not only one of the weaker songs, but it is giving us absolutely nothing narratively useful. All it does is have Vaggie reiterating how much she wants to protect Charlie, a sentiment that is already well expressed to the audience pretty much every time she opens her mouth, and telling us that Carlotta killed the angel to protect her children, something that we could have gotten in about 10 seconds. We absolutely did not need a full song for this. And we needed to give Vaggie and Charlie something real to fight about because a major travesty is that we don't get to get the gist of them as a couple before their bond is really tested with Vaggie's reveal. Now, generally, I think the show has actually done a great job at endearing us to the characters in the short time we had individually. 
Angel is the series' precious poster boy for a reason, but in tune with the series' cartoonish roots, Serpentius, as a simple character, is very impressive in execution in terms of conveying a full character arc delivered in very sparse, brief, and effective moments. But as said, I really wish we could take another shot at doing more to build the bond between them to the point where it's more viable that this is a group that would be willing to die for each other. You know, other than Angel and Husker, obviously. And hey, there just happens to be a pattern of running away from the found family core cast for Overlord drama. And believe me, I love Overlord drama. The Overlords in general are absolutely fantastic additions to the series, giving this incarnation of Hell a real sense of personality and hierarchy. But it is a pattern, cause old news, Viv is not known for being the most compelling or efficient writer. And it is the part of has -Been that is still the weakest. I'm not saying that the swearing isn't a little excessive. If anything, the problem with the swearing is that it's a little bit too basic. Be more creative with your obscenities. But then again, you know, she's written two shows and I haven't. And clearly she has her moments. However, what is she? She is an animator. And taking advantage of the studio numbers, the visual storytelling and character expression has been a godsend in this series. And it's a big reason why the musical numbers are as amazing as they are. It's not just the songs are generally great. It's that the song segments are a culmination of all of the best technical aspects of this show. It's where the animation is the best. It's where the comedy is the best. It's where a lot of the character work is the best. It's where the writing is the best. So conclusion has been good, could be better, result of creator who has never made show before, but still impressive for creator who has never made show before, or rather creator who went from writing no shows to two shows at the same time. And yes, this series leans more into a fun spectacle than having the time to really dig into their themes or characters, but they are definitely there and they are definitely compelling. I would also say that this is them consciously leaning into their strengths. And even in its flawed state, I am really glad that it has become as big as it has. I'm glad that it's been big enough to officially be one of the cultural events of 2024 so far. Cause you know, the, the future ain't looking so good. And now for the likely very long wait until Stolas and Blitz's breakup. I'm sure the internet will be very sane and not crazy about it. Cause hell is forever and it's meant to suck a lot. So give up your dumb endeavor cause you don't have a shot. The rules are black and white, there's no need to try to fight it. The burden for the lives until we kill them again. Oh my god, it's so good! <laughs> Basically, with the giant classism theme draped over the series, Charlie, as the elitist Nepo baby, initially believes in the capitalism myth that all you need to do is work hard enough and you can make it to the next level. Where premarital sex is, uh, I guess, the equivalent of avocado toast, I guess. Only to reveal that Heaven is the literal gatekeeping elite whose literal job is not to invite people in, but to keep as many people out. Uh, we don't know how they get in here. Uh, it just kind of happens, I guess. Anyway, you, you had your chance. You should have used your time on Earth to go to college. 